You want me to just start, Gabriel, or are you going to? No, I'll go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Gabriel Meyer, the executive director of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. Uh, tonight is a departure from our normal programming, a guided study session rather than uh, a lecture per se, an introduction to Ruskin's first masterwork, Modern Painters, which was published in 1843, its author aged 24, identified at least for this first installment only as a graduate of Oxford. The work initially written in defense of Ruskin's artistic idol, uh, Turner, J.M.W. Turner, eventually ran to five volumes written over a period of 17 years from 1843 to 1860. Over the next two weeks, Professor Sarah Atwood will take us interactively through a kind of book-ended introduction to this key Ruskin text, tonight, Modern Painters One, and next week, the final volume of the series, Modern Painters Five, kind of bird's eye view of this, of this, uh, this great work. We'll be reading uh, selected excerpts from each of the two volumes uh, in turn with open discussion, not only at the end, which is our want, uh, but after each of the excerpts. So there'll be a kind of uh, flow of discussion as we work through uh, these, uh, these, uh, these excerpts. Uh, we decided last year, actually, on the basis of our group study of Unto This Last with uh, Professor Jim Spates, who is with us this evening, uh, to make this study dimension something that we do at least uh, once a year, uh, that is a study of a major work of Ruskin together. Couple of preliminaries. In order for these study sessions to be really effective, those of us attending should read the selected excerpts posted on our website uh, in the calendar section, www.ruskinartclub.org. There, there you'll find, uh, we also have on that website links to a PDF of the whole book, if any of you are ambitious enough for that. Uh, that's also available on our Ruskin website under resources. A little preliminary reading will go a long way, I think, towards making these sessions and our discussions more fruitful. I'm also uh, going to post tonight an essay that Sarah published uh, in 2010, some years ago, in Carlisle Studies Annual on Ideas of Imitation, Ruskin, Plato, and Aesthetics, which I think will give us a little uh, broader uh, framework for what we're discussing tonight. Because of the interactive factor, we're doing something differently with regard to muting. Instead of muting everyone uh, at the beginning of the presentation as we do normally, I'm going to ask each of you uh, to mute yourselves when Sarah starts to give her introduction uh, and uh, when she starts speaking and then unmute yourself obviously when you wish to speak during the various times for discussion. I think this will make the exchanges uh, a little freer. Sarah Atwood uh, teaches English and writing at Portland State University and Portland Community College. She's a board member of the Ruskin Art Club and co-director with Jim Spates of the Ruskin Society of North America. Sarah has lectured widely both in the US and abroad on John Ruskin, education, the environment and language. Her work has been published in 19th Century Prose, the Journal of pre raphaelite Studies, and Carlisle Studies Annual. She is the author of the book, Ruskin's Educational Ideas, and has contributed essays to a number of other publications, including Teaching Victorian Literature in the 21st Century, John Ruskin and 19th Century Education, William Morris and John Ruskin, and Victorian Environmental Nightmares. She has lectured widely on Ruskin, both in the US and abroad. Uh, she delivered the 17th annual Ruskin lecture, co-sponsored by the Ruskin Art Club and Doheny Libraries at USC in September, 2017, on valuing education in a market society. In February, two, uh, 2019, during Ruskin's bicentenary year, 
She gave a lecture at the Houghton Library at Harvard University to mark the opening of the library's exhibition, Victorian Visionary, John Ruskin and the Realization of the Ideal. She also presented at the Bicentenary Conference, John Ruskin, 19th Century Visionary, 20th Century Inspiration at the Huntington Library in San Marino. She's a companion of the Guild of St. George. Without further ado, Sarah. Thanks, Gabriel, very much. Um, it's good to see you all here tonight. Um, I love this idea of studying Ruskin closely. It's, you know, with modern painters, it, with five volumes is hard. Um, when we were picking the readings, it would have been ideal to be able to read something from every volume, but we could be at it for a year or so. So we're just kind of, as Gabriel said, giving a, a bird's eye view and an introduction. And hopefully um, you'll be interested and intrigued enough to read more of modern painters on your own. And there's, I mean, there are just, treasure houses. So each volume is wonderful. Um, I have to say that the fifth, third and fifth volumes are my favorites, um, but I think that they're all very, very valuable and will reward your reading. I do want to point out that, you know, at the point that Ruskin wrote Modern Painters, he's 24, so he is quite young, um, but he's not completely untried as a writer. He's already written a lot of juvenilia at this point, but he's also published articles and he had published one book, The Poetry of Architecture. Um, this was not published under his name either. It was published under um, the pseudonym Katafusen, which means, and I might be mispronouncing that, um, according to nature. So he had already put some work out into the world. Um, but at 24, you know, he does decide to publish this book, which, you know, is very, it's radical in the sense that he's making the case for modern painters as against um, the old masters. And he was reacting to poor reviews of Turner. Um, you already know, I'm sure, that Ruskin was a great admirer of Turner, um, that he elevated Turner above all of the contemporary painters. Um, he had read reviews of Turner that were very critical, and he said that these raised me to the height of black anger in which I have remained pretty nearly ever since. And having by that time some confidence in my power of words and not merely judgment, but sincere experience of the charm of Turner's work, I wrote an answer of which I wish I could now find any fragment. So he wrote a letter to Blackwoods, which had published this review. Um, he didn't end up publishing the letter. Um, his father said they should check with Turner first to see if he wanted it published, and it did not end up getting published. But the impulse that he had to defend Turner led him eventually to write Modern Painters. Some of the criticism of Turner's work, um, I, wanted, I want you to hear what some of that was like so you can get an idea to what Ruskin was, um, was responding to. So the 1842 Royal Academy exhibition evoked criticism of this sort. So the Literary Gazette wrote of Turner's The Dagano and The Camposanto have a gorgeous ensemble and are produced by wonderful art, but they mean nothing. They are produced as if by throwing handfuls of white and blue and red at the canvas letting what chance to stick, stick, and then shadowing in some forms to make the appearance of a picture. And yet there is a fine harmony in the highest range of color to please the sense of vision. We admire and we lament to see such genius so employed. But farther on, you may fare worse. Number 182 is a snowstorm of most unintelligible character, the snowstorm of a confused dream with a steamboat making signals and apparently like the painter who was in it, going by the lead. Neither by land or water was such a scene ever witnessed. And of 338, burial at sea, though there is a striking effect, still the whole is so idealized and removed from truth that instead of the feeling it ought to affect, it only incites ridicule. And number 353 caps all before for absurdity without even any of the redeeming qualities in the rest. It represents Bonaparte facetiously described as the exile and the rock limpet standing on the seashore at St. Helena. The whole thing is so truly ludicrous that the recent teniatus even of the amici is absolutely impossible. Um, the Athenaeum was also critical and wrote, what are we getting here? Only by contemplation of Cressic's delicious landscape, it seems, could the spectator be prepared for the painful effect of Turner's. This gentleman has on former occasions chosen to paint with cream or chocolate, yolk of egg or currant jelly, here he uses his whole array of kitchen stuff. We cannot fancy the state of eye which will permit anyone cognizant of art to treat these rhapsodies as Lord Byron treated Christabel. 
Neither can we believe in any future revolution which shall bring the world round to the opinion of the worshiper, if worshippers such frenzies still possess. The burial of Wilkie and Napoleon were guide in turn, and the critique, critique, this critique concluded with surprise that the perpetrator of such outbreaks should have been allowed a place on the exhibition's walls. So these, these were pretty strong um, criticisms of Turner that Ruskin was responding to, not, not just a, a mild aside. It's often been argued that, well, not maybe not often, but some people have the impression that Ruskin introduced Turner to the English public, which of course was not the case. You know, Turner had been an academician for 20 years at this point already. Um, as Cook and Waterburn point out in the library edition, Ruskin rescued Turner not from obscurity, but from misunderstanding. He was not the first to praise Turner, but he intervened in order that he should be praised rightly. It was, as we have seen, the change to Turner's later manner and the contemptuous misunderstanding of this change on the part of the critics that called Ruskin into the fray. He stemmed the tide of war, and in doing so, he laid the foundations not only of a better appreciation of a great master and of broader views of the art of painting, but also generally of saner and more scientific criticism. And one thing I think you'll probably note in the readings that we gave you for tonight is the way that Ruskin structures his argument. Um, his method is starting everywhere from a particular fact. And he gets this from the influence of Aristotle. He has elaborate classifications and divisions. There's marginal summaries. Um, we lose the marginal summaries in the later, um, later volumes. And these are reminiscent of Locke. Um, and he often cites Locke, the essay on the human understanding in the earlier chapters of the volume. He proceeds very scientifically. He's very attuned to language, um, to the meanings of individual words. He's very concerned um, when language is misused, as we'll see in some of these um, readings that we have for tonight. Um, he wants definitions to be exact. Although eventually there are five volumes of modern painters, there is a unity of purpose to them. Um, I would say it's a developing purpose. There's an increasing focus in the later volumes on social and political questions, but that's always there even in the early volumes. I mean, one thing I always say about Ruskin is that, that his interest in social reform, in, in political ideas, sometimes people think, oh, that's the later part of his career. But even in the art criticism in the very beginning, he's always concerned with these things. They might not be at the foregrounded in the way that they are later in his writing, but they're always there. And really, so when he, when he focuses more on them in his later career, he's just bringing out um, a concern that has always been present. So volume one, as Gabriel noted already, 1843, volume two, 1846, volumes three and four were both um, published in 1856, and then the final volume in 1860. The volumes, all of them, um, were very well received, and the reviews of Modern Painters one were really favorable despite what was its audacity, you know, a young man making these pronouncements about art. What impressed critics the most, as Cook and Wedderburn say, was the closeness of the author's reasoning, his wealth of illustrative reference, and the force and beauty of his style. One of the early not earliest notices of the book was in the Globe newspaper in August of 1843, and it's pronounced the volume to be the production of one who is profoundly versed in the principles as well as in the mechanical details of the art. It is equally clear that he has studied nature with the most enthusiastic devotion and in localities and under circumstances, especially propitious to the study. It is evidently the work of a poet as well as of a painter and one of no common order. The dryness, which would appear to be almost inseparable from a disquisition on art is utterly lost in the bursts of startling eloquence, poetic feeling and touching pathos, which everywhere abound in this beautiful book. Charlotte Bronte admired modern painters and said in a quote that has now become very well known, I have lately been reading modern painters and I have derived from the work much genuine pleasure and I hope some edification. At any rate, it made me feel how ignorant I had previously been on the subject which it treats. Hitherto, I have only had instinct to guide me in judging of art. I feel now as if I had been walking blindfold. This book seems to give me eyes. And in 1856, George Eliot reviewed the third volume of Modern Painters in the Westminster Review, expressing great admiration and saying, among other things, the truth of infinite value that Ruskin teaches is realism, the doctrine that all truth and beauty are to be attainable by a humble and faithful study of nature and not by substituting vague forms bred by imagination on the mists of feeling in place of definite substantial reality. The thorough acceptance of this doctrine would remold our life. 
and he who teaches its application to any one department of human activity with such power as Mr. Ruskin's is a prophet for his generation. So high praise indeed. Um, and there were critics, but there were more admirers. Um, Ruskin really, really came into his own and, and began to make a career as a critic of art with this book. Um, you know, by the time, you know, the mid-century comes around, he is looked to, he's, first of all, he's a very public person, but he's also looked to as an expert on art. And when he does start focusing or foregrounding more the social and political aspects of his concerns, he gets um, a lot of criticism for doing so. There are many critics who say, you know, he should stick to his last. Um, he's an art critic. What is he doing um, nosing into political and social questions? And so at some point in the 1850s into the early 1860s, he becomes frustrated with the fact that he's known primarily as an art critic. And he says he's known for um, you know, being a painter in pretty words. And he starts to write a little bit differently at that point as well. And you can see that over the course of the volumes, um, the change in tone. So it's interesting to kind of track um, his concerns and the changes in style that go along with that through the volumes. I do wanna read you one passage from um, volume one that we're not reading tonight that he, Ruskin later took out when he, in a later edition of Modern Painters One as being too overwrought. And it's a description of Turner. And Turner, glorious in conception, unfathomable in knowledge, solitary in power, with the elements waiting upon his will and the night and the morning obedient to his call, sent as a prophet of God to reveal to men the mysteries of his universe, standing like the great angel of the apocalypse, clothed the cloud and with a rainbow upon his head, and with the sun and stars given into his hand. It is poetic writing. Um, it's beautiful and powerful writing. Ruskin later thought it was too much of, you know, what he, the purple prose that he was tired, tired of having attributed to him. He wanted to be heard on social questions in a more serious way. And so he did um, take that out of later editions. So that's, I want to give you a little bit of a background in the book, um, give you a sense of where it was coming from, why he wrote it. And I think at this point, we should probably move on to do some of the, the reading from tonight. Thank you, Bill. You wanted me to read the first passage? Okay. Not where you wanted me to start. It's, uh, I thought we should start uh, the second paragraph of page 100. Mm -hmm. I wish to point out and finish um, at the very top of the next page, contradicted by their experience. Okay. Are you going to put that on the screen or do you want me to read it from my? Yes, Joey, if we can go on to page 100. There we go. I wish to point out. Okay. Yeah. I wish to point out this distinct source of pleasure clearly at once and only to use the word imitation in reference to it. Whenever anything looks like what it is not, the resemblance being so great as nearly to deceive, we feel a kind of pleasurable surprise, an agreeable excitement of mind, exactly the same in its nature as that which we receive from juggling. Whenever we perceive this in something produced by art, that is to say, whenever the work is seen to resemble something which we know it is not, we receive what I call an idea of imitation. Why such ideas are pleasing, it would be out of our present purpose to inquire. We only know that there is no man who does not feel pleasure in his animal nature from a gentle surprise, and that such surprise can be excited in no more distinct manner than by the evidence that a thing is not what it appears to be. Now, now two things are requisite to our complete and most pleasurable perception of this. First, that the resemblance be so perfect as to amount to a deception. Secondly, that there be some means of proving at the same moment that it is a deception. The most perfect ideas and pleasures of imitation are therefore, when one sense is contradicted by another, both bearing as po positive evidence on the subject as each is capable of alone, as when the eye says a thing is round and the finger says it is flat. They are therefore never felt in so high a degree as in painting, where appearance of projection, roughness, hair, velvet, etc., are given with a smooth surface, or in waxwork, where the first evidence of the senses is perpetually contradicted by their experience. So you've all read this ahead of time. What we want to do now is just open discussion, um, not just to the passage, only the passage that I read, um, but to these, this passage on um, 
imitation, the chapter on imitation. It's very hard choosing excerpts from a book that has so much in it. Um, I went back and forth and back and forth. So I'm hoping that these excerpts interested you. But I think this is an important concept to Ruskin. And he's very clear here in defining it, telling us what he considers imitation is and what it's not. So I'll just open to all of you and for your impressions of the passage and what stood out to you, um, what interest do you do in this particular excerpt? Well, Sarah, it's Jim. Let me let me respond very briefly to uh, to what you read. Um, this book essentially took the intellectual, artistic, culturally interested part of English society by storm. This passage is just one of dozens upon dozens in this book and in many of Ruskin's later books that just sort of, as you read it and read it carefully, lifts you to a higher level. You have not, and I mean by you, me, and anybody else who, for whom it describes, you have not thought these things before. And that's what Charlotte Bronte meant. Ruskin taught me to see. He made me look at paintings in ways I had never looked at them before. He made me think about, in, in this case, imitation in a way I'd never thought about it before. In fact, I was never even sure I was thinking about imitation in the way that I just read it in this last paragraph. That is the exhilaration of reading Ruskin and the great pleasure of reading Ruskin still for anybody who's willing to give him the time. It's a lovely passage and I thank you for selecting it because it gives us a sense of the young man, only 24 years of age. Who of us in the audience tonight or people that we know could have done anything quite so wonderful at the age of 24. I, I certainly could not have done. But in any event, it was the passages like this and they just uh, abound in Modern Painters One that people read and said, oh my goodness, this is just a special, a special person teaching us about a part of the world that we never knew before. So thank you for the passage. Uh, I, I'm moved by it and enthralled by it as I, I am by so much of Ruskin. Sarah, one thing that strikes me is, um, of course, how platonic this, you know, the, yeah. this, the, the whole idea of imitation is uh, uh, rooted in, in um, Plato's allegory of the cave and uh, other, other aspects. Um, I'm just going to read, uh, I was reflecting on it earlier this week, and um, there's a, a great quote uh, summer, uh, some kind of a summary of what, what Plato is, is saying about imitation, and then I'm going to reflect just a comment from Ruskin. Plato seems to be saying that art, when, uh, of this whole notion of imitation, that art cannot represent reality because it is only a mirror, mm. reflecting what is not, in any case, reality. We can strive towards enlightenment through seeking truth by depicting in artistic representation what is good and is therefore a reflection of beauty and moral truth. Only in this way are we to achieve enlightenment. And, and this is the quote from Plato. And see in the light of the sun and the fire, the real objects, the forms face to face and gain true knowledge for the first time. There's a marvelous quote, not from modern painters, but from his lectures, a book of lectures, Eagle's Nest, where Ruskin mm -hmm. writes, I think very much in this same vein. Um, there is nothing that I tell you with more earnest desire that I that you should believe than this, that you will not, that you will never love art well till you love what she mirrors better. Yeah, I love that quote. I love that book, but especially that quote. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this whole notion of imitation uh, in its relationship to reality, to fact. Yeah, that's why I sent you that essay on Ruskin, Plato, and imitation, mm -hmm. which is all about that, because Ruskin, of course, knew Plato very well. Uh, and I thought I think it's interesting to, to look at Plato's ideas of imit imitation and the way that Ruskin writes about it, especially here in Modern Painters. Because Ruskin does, you know, he says also in this excerpt that imitation has its uses, but that it's also contemptible. It's yeah, lower down on the lower down, yeah, scale. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.
He says, these ideas and pleasures are the most contemptible which can be received from art. And first, because it's necessary to their enjoyment that the mind should reject the impression and address of the thing represented and fix itself only upon the reflection that it's not what it seems to be. So we get preoccupied with the fact that it is imitation and we're not thinking about really the thing itself. All higher noble emotion or thought is thus rendered physically impossible while the mind exults in what is very likely a strictly sensual pleasure. And then he says that they're contemptible in the second place because not only do they preclude the spectator from enjoying inherent beauty, they can only be received from mean and paltry subjects because it is impossible to imitate anything. Sorry, I'm reading from my hand out here. Really great. So imitation is, it's, it's, it's interesting. We enjoy it. It gives us pleasure. Um, but for Ruskin, it's a, it's a lower sort of pleasure. Mm-hmm. I think of, for instance, um, you know, painting that is done with photographic sort of realism. Mm-hmm. You know, we look at a painting like that and we say, wow, it's amazing that that painter could capture that. And it looks exactly like, you know, my iPhone or whatever it is that, you know, that the painter has captured. I actually saw a painting like this recently where the painter had is photographic realism of an iPhone and a light bulb and a coin, you know, on a desk, objects on a desk, looks just like a photograph. And it kind of illustrated to me exactly what Ruskin means here because you get caught up in the novelty of the thing. You know, the fact that the painter has made it all look so real. And so that's what you're focusing on. And it's also true that the objects in this particular painting were nothing of very high, um, you know, contemplation or anything. They're just everyday objects, but mm-hmm. you're not really thinking about the things itself. You're, you're not having any elevated ideas. You're all caught up in the, the, the trickery of it. Mm-hmm. And I think trickery is what Plato is concerned about, too. Right, right. There's that great quote where Ruskin talks about, speaking about imitation, where he says, to, to, to imitate, one simply needs a true eye, a steady hand, and moderate industry. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a craft. And, mm-hmm. and as, as you were saying, one of the things that Ruskin's disciples got into trouble about, some of his American disciples in particular, mm-hmm was they tried to imitate, uh, obviously learning from Ruskin, all these ama- amazing skill, uh, skills these, uh, in drawing. And then they went on to apply that to a kind of photorealist mm-hmm. rendering of, of architecture. And Ruskin would sort of say to them, well, it's a nice handcraft. It's, that's, you, you need these skills in order to do art, but that's not art. Right. He says at one point, um, it's not enough that it have the form, if it also, if it not also have the power. Um, it has to be. It can't just be imitation. It can't just be the form of the thing. It has to be also infused with the artist's vision. I mean, that's what really elevates, um, you know, one artist above another or a piece of art to greatness. Right. Well, we always have to remember that Ruskin is a teacher, and what he's doing in all of his pages. He's trying to teach us to see, as Charlotte Bronte said. Mm-hmm. He's trying to teach us to see things we may not have seen before, or if we have seen them, we haven't take, paid enough time to, pay, to understand them properly. The thing about Turner that is great, that he constantly emphasizes in all the modern painters' books, is that Turner could see nature. He could see the world in a way that most of us simply cannot. And Ruskin is at pains in all his books to teach us, his readers, to see things we haven't seen before, mm-hmm. and in so doing, to elevate us uh, to a higher level of, of human existence. Yeah. And he also writes um, at one point that you know Turner can paint a scene and make us feel as though we're there. He can put us into that scene because he has that vision and that ability to do that. It's not just a record of the scene. It's not just a notation. Mm-hmm. Um, he actually gives you the emotion and the feeling of being there. Stuart. I find it uh, a source of some curiosity that you quoted a criticism from the Athenaeum and the Literary Gazette in which uh, in particular the Athenaeum, I think uh, lodges a criticism against Turner. This may not be the place for this conversation, but it lodges a criticism against Turner that it's as if he were flinging pots of paint and letting it drip. <laughs> and stick where it might, uh, using chance and accident as a tool. 
However, ironically enough, later, yes. of course, there's this great uh, uh, lawsuit between uh, which Ruskin uh, lodges mm -hmm. against Whistler for doing exactly the same thing and using nearly the same language. Right. He, that he loses. So that's a curiosity that on the one hand, he's against a, a sort of a pot boiler, you know, renditions using high craft uh, 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 and sentimental objects. And he uses mm -hmm. the word sentimentality derogatorily. And on the other hand, he um, seems to come at uh, Whistler for precisely the opposite. <laughs> well, no? yeah, although, although the, the, li the uh, libel suit was against Ruskin, was a, was that's what I'm saying. Filed, yeah. Filed, yeah. By, yeah, but filed by Whistler. Sorry. I know. Oh, that's right. No, Ruskin didn't sue Whistler. Whistler Ruskin right, yeah, right. criticized him in a way that was uh, slander, right. uh, slanderous. Well, and, and, and Ruskin has often been, and we're getting out of ideas of imitation yeah. here, but that's okay because I yeah, think that's Ruskin. an interesting point that you raise um, because the language is very similar. And, you know, some critics of Ruskin have, have said, well, this is, you know, he championed Turner's late work, which, you know, is nearing Impressionism in some ways. That's That's what critics have said. And yet, you know, he he was very critical of um, of Whistler. You know, how how do you reconcile those things? Um, but I think Ruskin would say that what we've been talking about right here that Turner had um, a vision of the world and of nature that he brings to his art that Ruskin felt that Whistler lacked. I mean, Ruskin felt that Whistler was a hack, um, mm -hmm. whereas you know Turner was seeing and um, com you know communicating that vision. In his paint, in his paintings, whereas yeah. Whistler was just, you know, kind of having a bit of fun. Now, people who admire Whistler wouldn't agree with that, and I'm not saying that Ruskin was right, but I think that Rus that's how Ruskin saw it. Yeah, they, oh, two of course, things. Whistler, think, Whistler think, did have the subject. He was sentimental in that there's almost nothing in Whistler that is not either right. a portrait or right. a portrait right. okay, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or a uh, you know a sewing a, a woman sewing or the background of a cavernous room, but the atmospherics of it seem to be something Ruskin would have had a positive response to. And yet I understand because Ruskin thought about the nobility and the grandeur of Turner, as opposed to the sentiment, quote unquote, Ruskin's word, the sentimentality of, Turner, of, of Whistler, yeah. the objectivity of Whistler. Well, there was another issue too, I think, uh, rightly or wrongly, I think Ruskin thought of Whistler as trying to produce cheap Turner. Yeah. In other words, you saw you saw Turner as going through this whole, you know, enormous artistic process to produce these effects. And he saw Whistler as someone who was simply imitating, you know, aspects of Turner for for reputation. The other issue with the Whistler situation was the gallery at which Whistler was showing his work was a gallery that Ruskin was was uh, helping to support for emerging painters. And Whistler, in his typical style, was asking like three or four times what any other <sighs> painter there was asking for his canvases. And it, you know, irritated Ruskin to no end. You know, so there were many, many, uh, as always with these things, there were many, many issues at work in that stew. But I think yeah. we have to say that Ruskin is nearsighted in this sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, as much as we all admire Ruskin, I mean, he did have blind spots. You know, I mean, he was he had a blind spot about Constable too. Um, mm. Yeah. So you know, there's and there's other examples that you can come up with. I mean, I don't think, you know, he he was he was great and in many ways, but not everyone, you know, there's things he didn't see that we now see differently and. Are confused by his uh, his blind spots or his narrowness. Right. He also, I was just, you know, I was just said in a class the other day. I was teaching Christina Rossetti, mm. and you know, he Ruskin was very critical of her, and he said that her meter was an abomination, and that she should go back and learn meter. And I don't think most of us would agree with him on that either. So I had to admit to my students that yes, this was a blind spot. Well, you think of you know what Ruskin would have thought, thought about. French landscape painting, early Impressionism, and yet Monet in 1900 said that all of Impressionist doctrine was in elements of, From Ruskin, of yeah. <laughs> So, you know, this is another kind of way in which Ruskin was not quite seeing the ramifications of his own right. insights. Mm -hmm. Sarah, can you talk a little bit more about what 
Ruskin thought of Constable because I've always wondered why he championed Turner so much over Constable when um, I don't know a lot of people see them as as reasonably similar uh, in some aspects. And the two great landscape painters of the period, yeah. Um, I believe he said about Constable that all his weather was great coat weather. I think that's the, I think that's the coat, yeah. Um, but he ha there's also a lot of Constable he hadn't seen. I mean, we've seen a lot more Constable than Ruskin had. Um, so, you know, he hadn't seen, for instance, I don't believe he'd seen any of the cloud studies, especially, I mean, you know, when I go back East, I go to the Yale Museum of British Art and they have a selection of Constable's cloud studies. And I remember the, you know, when I've seen these, I've thought, God, Ruskin would have loved these. Now, Ruskin was fascinated by clouds. He always made his own studies of clouds and notations of clouds. And I think to myself, how could he not have liked Constable? And then realized, well, he didn't see these. <laughs> you know? um, had he seen them, maybe he would have felt differently. So of the paintings that he saw, um, you know, he felt that they were you know, too similar, that the weather represented was always the same. Um, he was not drawn to them. Um, I tend to think if he had seen a wider array, array of Constable's work, he might have felt differently. Um, Did he, maybe he thought he was sort of plagiarizing himself over and over again with the same kind of atmosphere? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know the comments he made about Constable. I, I don't think to be an expert on his opinion on Constable, but um, but yeah, I mean, he, he didn't feel that Constable's work was, was anywhere near as, as visionary as Turner's either. Constable, again, is kind of almost more vegetable. <laughs> There's something very vegetable about Constable. Mm -hmm. It's enormous, you know, number of trees and plants and rivers and, and, and it's all very carefully uh, rendered, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's, there is a lack of, um, a lack of that, that grandeur that T Turner brings to the uh, canvas. Maybe spontaneity? Hmm. Maybe, and I think also, I mean, Turner is, Turner is such a master of light also. I mean, you walk into any gallery with a Turner painting and it just practically leaps off the wall at you. You know it's a Turner mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's qualities in Turner that, and I think maybe that's what Ruskin also was, you know, had trouble with, with Constable and why he says all his weather is great coat weather. Um, you know, he, I think he felt the palette was, was more limited than, than Turner as well. I don't know, I mean, Gabriel or, or Jim, do you want to comment on that? Just, just to comment just in the yeah. sense also, there's a conceptual aspect. Um, Ruskin uh, has a problem with landscape painters who are sort of celebrating the static order of nature, mm -hmm. which is what he sees in much 18th century painting. Mm -hmm. what, what he was interested in Turner was that Turner saw nature as energy, yeah. as movement, as force. And right. so I, I think uh, not, on, not only Constable, but uh, uh, many of the French landscape painters and uh, Ruskin critiques for this for this this search for a kind of stasis, a kind of nature of static order rather than mm -hmm. uh, a romantic right. nature of energy. Right. But at the same time, he has a conversion in Italy when he sees the Veronese, that's great Veronese, mm -hmm. uh, and he calls it, he, as I recall, he says it's the gorgeousness of it, unconverted yeah. me from this, this evangelical uh, Puritanism to a love of that which is uh, sybaritic and, and, and gorgeous. And he becomes very different. It changes him radically, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, by then he'd also discovered Tintoretto. So. Yes, yes. Yeah. But that one painting is singled out. I was mm -hmm. reading Hewison uh, avidly and enjoying, I mean, even if you're minor in philosophy, you need it in order to <laughs> broach Hewison, who is so uh, austere in a way. He's very interesting and, uh, and recondite uh, writer on Ruskin and uh, been loving it, great, great work. And I think also it's important here to, to say again that, you know, with Ruskin, he, he had such a long writing career. And if you read him, you, know, you, can, you can track his thinking over years and years. And it's really important, I think, never to isolate Ruskin at one, in one book or at one mm -hmm. point in his career. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, he, he says he felt that he was never in the, he always needed to contradict himself at least three times yeah. before he could come down on a, on a, on a point. And, you know, he's been accused of contradiction, but really, I just think it's development. 
um, you know, we see the development of his mind and his ideas, and sometimes he changes his mind, and he's not afraid to say so when he does. Um, so it's always dangerous, I think, dangerous is too strong a word. It's always risky to isolate Ruskin, you know, at one point mm -hmm. um, in his life, at one point in his writing, because, you know, there's this constant development and flux in his thinking. And I, that's one of the things that most fascinates me about him is that we can witness that um, and watch the progress of his mind. And let's remember Whitman, I contain multitudes. Multitudes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir, we should probably move. Maybe to yes, the... yeah, we should move on to the next reading, which um, Jim Spates is going to read the next selection for us. Okay, let's see if we one, get it up two, on the screen here. Yes. Is page that one, it? Ten, on Joey? Page 102, Joey. No, no, no. No. I, I'm sorry, which page? Page 110. Nope. Okay. One. There's 110. So, starting this then is the real meaning and ending. Okay with intellectual beauty. I've got it. All right, so here's the second passage, folks, from, um, from Modern Painters 1. This, then, is the real meaning of this disputed word. Perfect taste is the faculty of receiving the greatest possible pleasure from those material sources which are attractive to our moral nature in its purity and perfection. He who receives little pleasure from these sources wants taste. He who receives pleasure from any other sources has false or bad taste. And it is thus that the term taste is to be distinguished from that of judgment, with which it is constantly confounded. Judgment is a general term, expressing definite action of the intellect, and applicable to every kind of object which can be submitted to it. There may be judgment of congruity, judgment of truth, judgment of justice, and judgment of difficulty and excellence. But all these exertions of the intellect are totally distinct from taste properly so called, which is the instinctive and instant preferring of one material object to another without any obvious reason, except that it is proper to human nature in its perfection to do so. Observe, however, I do not mean by excluding direct exertion of the intellect from ideas of beauty, to assert that beauty has no effect on nor connection with the intellect. All our moral feelings are so interwoven with our intellectual powers that we cannot affect the one without in some degree addressing the other. And in high ideas of beauty, it is more, it is more than probable that much of the pleasure depends on delicate and untraceable perceptions of fitness, propriety, and relation which are purely intellectual and through which we arrive at the noblest ideas of what is commonly and rightly called, in quotes, intellectual beauty, close quotes. So that's the passage and um, it is quintessential Ruskin. It's beautiful Ruskin. So let's see if we have any reactions from those who've come out to be with us tonight. I could I could add here. Um, Let's that keep one of the my, quote up, shall we? I'm sorry. Keep Let's the quote keep up. The quote up on the screen, if we can. Yeah, Joey, can we keep the quote up on the screen? I am. Uh, I'm reminded in reading this passage of a wonderful passage in Ruskin's lecture that he gave in 1864 in the town of Bradford in the Midlands, Traffic, right. called Traffic, where he talks about taste and he says. Uh, I, I want to take a moment to define what we mean by this word taste. He said that taste is not just a morality. He said it is the only morality. morality. We define ourselves by our taste. And I used to have my students read that lecture traffic um, in, when I was teaching full time. And we would go through it page by page, paragraph by paragraph. And I would say to them things like, and then Ruskin goes on to say in the same passage, you tell me, tell me what you like and I'll tell you what you are. I'll tell you what your taste is. And then he gives an example of a little girl who likes to run and, and dance in the daisies. He gives another example of a little boy who throws rocks at sparrows and of an older fellow who's obviously a recovering or maybe not recovering alcoholic who loves his quartern of gin. And he says, now we know who these people are. We see what they like. And I would say to my students, so sitting here right now, 
cast your minds back to your rooms where you live in, in, in the dorms of these colleges and tell me what images you have on your wall, what paintings are on your wall, what posters are on your wall, what books are on your tables, what television shows do you watch at night? And we can tell you what your taste is, what you value, what you think is the most important in life. Taste is not amorality. Ruskin says, taste is the only morality. And this passage reminded me of that wonderful bit mm. in the mm. traffic lecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it reminded me of that too, Jim. In fact, I wrote down right while we were reading that, show me what you, what you like and I'll tell you what you are, um, which is, and that's a great lecture. And the idea that taste is the only morality. I've always loved that lecture. I don't know though, as I get older, I don't know as though I agree with him as much as I used to. Well, how would you change it, Sarah? I don't know. I, I think, I mean, I go back to what Stuart said about I contain multitudes. People do contain multitudes. Um, sometimes they like frivolous things and it doesn't mean that they're frivolous people. I don't know if, if, if I now find it too exacting. I don't know. It just, I don't respond to it as wholeheartedly as I once did. Well, what happens if they only like frivolous things? Well, if they only like frivolous things, they may be frivolous people, but people like a lot of different things. People like things that are high art and sometimes they also can enjoy low art at the same time. They can hold both things. I don't know, I mean, what do others think? I'm just kind of putting that out there. Well, I think, you know, I think if you look at traffic, um, that point is made early in the lecture and then later on he goes on to question the good, the good burgers <laughs> of the businessmen of Bradford about why it is questioning why it is that they want Gothic churches mm. and different kinds of buildings for their houses and what that, what those taste questions reveal about the bifurcation of their of their of their mentality. So I think in that broader sense it's 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 um, it's a, it's a, a powerful insight that that there's meaning maybe not obvious meaning but there's meaning in the in the taste choices that we make about how we see the world. And I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, and that, and certainly what Ruskin is urging them to do is to see in effect one world, a world of connections and relations mm -hmm. uh, and responsibilities so that that bifurcation, that compartmentalization of life into little compartments, uh, you know, is revealing. But he yes. would have said, go, go ahead. ahead. No, um, I was just, I was gonna say he would have said, if you had a taste for Whistler, then you were at fault. Well, if you didn't have a taste for Turner as well, and understood that Turner was a higher taste than Whistler, that he would say that. Mm -hmm. well, we, we live in, in an era of absurd uh, political correctness. Uh, you know, for example, I mean, we have to refer to bi non-binary people as they or them. On the one hand, this is a point made by a, a controversial psychologist named Jordan Peterson. Uh, we, uh, but on the other hand, we uh, tolerate um, a surgical alteration of sexual organs in young people if they have a gender issue. And that's relevant uh, in that what has happened in terms of social understanding, the business I'm in is the business of, of taste altogether. There's, I've been criticized roundly by uh, people in the very, very contemporary and conceptual art world of suggesting that taste matters. So I look at something, I say, well, it's not tastefully framed. Uh, oh, well, you can't say that. <laughs> or, or an object is not tasteful. Um, taste is an enormously subjective term today. I think we have to perceive Ruskin as evoking a dialectic about issues mm -hmm. that are deep, profound, subtle, and, and delicate, as he says, without holding him to uh, our time uh, at all. It's right. unfair because his narrowness is a, is a virtue then and today is, is seen differently. Yeah, well, I think too, it's also Ruskin's insights are a dialectic tool. That's right. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and tools are sharp. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're meant to be. And they're, what they're meant to do fundamentally is to get you to ask questions, the deep questions. Well, they are meant they are meant to do that, Gabriel, but they are at the same time meant to raise you to a, a higher level of understanding. So in this passage mm -hmm. that we he uses the term, uh, I ended at the very at that point, intellectual beauty. And someone earlier mentioned that there was this connection, a very deep connection indeed, between Ruskin and Plato and Plato's theory of the forms. Intellectual beauty is a form in the Platonic sense. Mm -hmm. It exists in the world Ruskin would have us understand. We can know what it is if we take the time to study it. We can understand that certain, certain instances of things in the world are representative of closer to the ideal of what intellectual beauty mm -hmm. is. Uh, if we take the time to study it. It's not just a frivolous thing. It's a very serious thing that we must think about and cogitate deeply in our own souls about to understand what is actually truly beautiful in the world. Mm -hmm. And Jim, a great example of it is the way in which mathematicians refer to certain equations and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, as, as having beauty. Yes. Yes. Solution to issues and problems in mathematics. I, as the highest mathematics as, are often referred to as a beautiful solution. And that's a, the epitome of intellectual beauty, if it, it seems to me. Yes, I agree. Ruskin is always trying to get us to understand the beauty of the universe in which we live and the gift of that universe. He wants us to see that. So in his paintings, some of which we, we know, many of us have seen some of them, either here or in England or in various shows, he paints everything. He paints a dead robin, he paints a, a, a decaying leaf, he paints all these flowers, he paints sunsets, he paints sunrises, and he's always at pains to show us the glories of the natural world from nature. That was his, his, um, his first uh, pseudonym, Keda Fushin, from nature. He believed that nature was a gift and it was beautiful. And if we took the time to see it, we would see the beauty in all things. We would extract the beauty from all things. And in so doing, we would be elevated ourselves. Don't we have to and, oh, oh, no, I was just going to say, I, and I like this passage here in this chapter. Um, and if I can just read it, he says, ideas of beauty are among the noblest, which can be presented to the human mind, invariably exalting and purifying it according to their degree. And it would appear that we are intended by the deity to be constantly under their influence because there is not one single object in nature which is not capable of conveying them and which to the rightly perceiving mind does not present an incalculably greater number of beautiful than of deformed parts. There being in fact scarcely anything in pure undiseased nature like positive deformity, but only degrees of beauty. And that, that acceptance of imperfection in nature, mm -hmm. I mean, Ruskin, he, first of all, he, he talks about imperfection in other works. Um, where he says, you know, all things are imperfect and imperfect, seeking perfection is, is fruitless. But that idea of nature, you know, even where it's apparently imperfect, is still beautiful. It also reminds me of Hopkins, who, you know, writes the poem Pied Beauty, which is really the same concept, um, which he takes largely from Ruskin, because he, you know, he also admired Ruskin. Um, and I love that passage, because I think it, it reminds me of Ruskin's, I, um, you know, other writings on imperfection and how we need to embrace imperfection and not try and, and reject it or seek only for perfection. That is a terrific passage, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think it's one of the real themes in Ruskin. Uh, and one of his challenges to us is how much of his thought and artistic endeavor is really related to the revelation of the real. Mm -hmm. and his engagement with the real. I found this great quote from uh, Patricia Ball. It, it ties in, Sarah, with what you were just saying. Uh, this is a, a, uh, uh, an article on Ruskin. In his theory, Ruskin puts forward the proposition that stating facts is not a prosaic, but a challenging imaginative activity. In his practice, he demonstrates that there is a poetry of statement and that a religion, religious vision can be stimulated by its singular veracity, feeding on the wonder of fact as it is, rather than transforming it 
into a symbol. And then she goes on to quote, you know, Hopkins in, in, in Inscape. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there, there's so many parallels in, in this notion of, of Ruskin wanting us to see nature in itself and then and and to 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 understand the the um, the kind of the, a kind of metaphysical realism that be grounded in fact and in the in, mm -hmm. in the real and in the wonder of the real. It makes me think of three things, uh, not necessarily in a linear way. Uh, one is uh, that we have to contextualize Ruskin's uh, op op opinions and thinking uh, in the evangelical context in which he was raised, mm -hmm. and which he later abandoned mm -hmm. uh, in a certain profound way, uh, on the one hand. Then we have to look at imperfection, uh, quote unquote, uh, in the context of the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, mm -hmm. uh, that, mm -hmm. that there's beauty in all things, including decay. Mm -hmm. Iman Bloom, a great artist on the East Coast, not well known here, painted rotting limbs and recently got it was, I mean, he was in the Venice Museum, a great artist, I recommend. And then the third thing is that he, I wonder, and this is quite off the wall, Ruskin, I think, would have been thrilled at the quantum theory of entanglement in mm. which an object has spooky action at a distance, to quote Einstein. We understand that an atom flipping in one location has a corresponding Adam flipping the other way in another location. It's been proven now that such a thing is real and nobody knows how it happens. It was a mystery. And to me, Ruskin is always invoking us to, inviting us to understand that all things are, are in a way, there's, there's a string theory. Of, 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 it's all mm -hmm. vibrating. We're all part of that. Yeah, that word entanglement is a word I've used in writing about Ruskin before because it suits him so well. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of the sympathy of things, right? mm -hmm. everything being connected, there being, you know, one great kind of unity. Mm -hmm. And that's an aspect of his vision that I have always found, you know, very appealing. It's one of the things that draws me to him is this, this idea of this kind of organic whole. Right. I, I do want to say, too, about these, these passages from Modern Painters, and we'll certainly we can come back to this next week when we talk about the passages from Modern Painters 5, because we'll notice a stylistic shift in Modern Painters 5. Um, I think in, in this book, especially, he's doing a lot of defining and, and narrowing terms. Um, as I said in, in my introduction there, he's really concerned with thinking about um, how we use these terms and then making clear how he's using them and how he believes they should be used, um, as opposed to kind of maybe a kind of a careless way that people tend to, to kind of fling them around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we say taste, what do we mean? He says, well, this is, this is what taste means. This is what judgment is. Um, this is what beauty is. Um, and these are tough terms, you know, to try and define. <laughs> um, but he wants to be very clear about his terms. And that's what I meant, you know, when I said in the beginning that he's almost like, you know, kind of goes about it in an almost scientific way, um, you know, defining and, and then narrowing and then clarifying. And not that he's not, you know, clear in Modern Painters 5. It's just that it's a very different sort of book by the time we get there. Sarah, should we move on? Yes, let's, uh, and I think you're going to read the next selection, right, I'm Gabriel? The next section. I enjoy this immensely. Um, what page are we on, Gabriel? We're on the, on the, this is on page, well, the reading is going to come from 553 and 554, pages 553. There we go, yeah. This is beginning with um, you will find nothing in the waterfalls. This is towards the end of that, of that page. Uh, well, just, uh, we're, we're in Modern Painters 5 now? No. No. This no, is, that's not this till is next week. Water, as water is, as painted by Turner. Oh, okay, good. At the end of, at the end of, of um, Modern Painters 1 is a whole series of reflections on why Turner's clouds, water, vegetation, the elements of his painting are superior to the ancients. So Ruskin keeps giving us these examples, these comparative examples of um, 
various um, natural phenomena as they appear in the works of uh, Turner. I know when I first read Modern Painters One, I, I found this absolutely exhilarating. These these chapters on the truth of water and the truth of clouds, um, kind of uh, special poetry. One thing that, that does always strike me about modern painters, we've seen, you'll see it in a moment. We have two things going. We have this very philosophical, Lockean, Platonic uh, diction mm. for the, the philosophical sections as he's arguing his way through getting us to feel our way through, through uh, certain basic concepts. And then there are these passages that just absolutely jump off the page, probably because in some cases they're drawn from his diaries because mm. they have an immediacy of, uh, of an engagement with nature, which puts them on a very different level. And this is perhaps one of the most striking of those, of those passages. This is when he describes um, the uh, describes Turner's waterfalls. You will find nothing in the waterfalls, even of our best painters, but springing lines of parabolic descent and splashing shapeless foam. And in consequence, though they may make you understand the swiftness of the water, they never let you feel the weight of it. The stream in their hands looks active, not supine, as if it leaped, not as if it fell. Now water will leap a little way, it will leap down a weir or over a stone, but it tumbles over a high fall like this. And it is when we have lost the parabolic line and arrived at the catenary, when we have lost the spring of the fall and arrived at the plunge of it, that we begin really to feel its weight and wildness. Where water takes its first leap from the top, it is cool and collected and uninteresting and mathematical, but it is when it finds that it has got into a scrape and has farther to go than it thought that its character comes out. It is then that it begins to writhe and twist and sweep out zone after zone in wilder stretching as it falls and to send down the rocket-like lance pointed whizzing shafts at its sides sounding for the bottom. And it is this prostration, this hopeless abandonment of its ponderous power to the air, which is always peculiarly expressed by Turner, and especially in the, in the case before us. While our other artists keeping to the parabolic line, where they do not lose themselves in smoke and foam, make their cataract look muscular and wiry, and may consider themselves fortunate if they can keep it from stopping, I believe the majesty of motion which Turner has given by these concentric catenary lines must be felt even by those who have never seen a high waterfall and therefore cannot appreciate their exquisite fidelity to nature. Yeah, this is, that's a really magnificent passage. And it also speaks to what you were saying before, um, Gabriel, about Turner capturing um, motion in nature and energy, right? Right. You know, not just giving us the look of a waterfall, but giving us actually the, the motion and the dynamic activity of a waterfall. Mm -hmm. And in that passage, Gabe, as in so many passages, um, there's the uh, almost the anthropomorphizing of nature. Right, mm -hmm. right. The, right. The, yeah. the waterfall has a consciousness. The right. clouds have a consciousness. The trees have a consciousness, they have an intent, they have a purpose, and we can know that purpose if we take the time to look. And Turner was able to do that and communicate that purpose to us in his work. Right. Yeah, Ruskin, Ruskin says elsewhere that things aren't either alive or dead, they're always more or less alive. Mm. Yeah, that marvelous line, the, the waterfall is, when the waterfall finds that it has gotten into a scrape, yeah. <laughs> and it's further to go than he thought. Right. That's right. That's a lovely bit. Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, and of course, what, one thing that strikes me about that passage, so much of the diction and the quizzing and the, all that language reminds me of Hopkins. 
Oh yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of those passages, um, you know, where some of the reviewers said that this was clearly written by a, a poet as well as a, as a painter. Mm -hmm. um, I think we see that there. I mean, and I'm glad you brought up the diction of, of Modern Painters One, and especially some of these passages that we're reading, because it, some of it does sound a bit didactic. You know, he's, he's, he's defining his terms. You know, he's leading us through, as you said, you know, he's helping leading us through these lines of thought. Um, and then we do get these really marvelous passages that are just so expressive and vivid and poetic. Uh, and, you know, they kind of stop us in our tracks, I think. Well, and also real, that whole notion, mm -hmm. I remember being, finding this revelational, the idea of the weight of water. Right. Yes. As it falls. It's not just splashing around, it's falling. Mm -hmm. A waterfall. And so Ruskin really really captures that 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 notion of how water uh, you know does how water is in this context right and we can also go back to those ideas of imitation here too because what he's saying is that you know imitating the look of a waterfall is not enough you know right. any someone can paint a waterfall you know make it look like <laughs> water falling but he's saying you know Turner is doing more than that. He's not just imitating a waterfall. You know, he's giving you actually kind of the essence of waterfall, if you will. You know, yeah, yeah, the right. energy of it as well. Yeah, which elevates his art and makes it, you know, on a higher level than just an imitation of of a cataract. And that's one of the things that happens once you read these Ruskin passages and you take them with you to look at Turner paintings. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to see exactly what he's talking about. One of my favorite bits, and I imagine it's a favorite bit of many of us, is his description of Turner's slave ship painting. Mm -hmm. and it's just so stunning. And if you look at the painting itself, which is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, it doesn't travel anymore because it's too fragile. But in, in, in Ruskin owned that painting for a number of years. Um, you, just, you just begin to understand why Turner is so great, because Ruskin yeah. shows you the things in the painting that make him that great that we would have missed otherwise most of us going and i speak for myself going to museums like a like a given artist or like a given painting and we go and look at it for a little while and then we move on and we don't study it ruskin said if you take one entire day just to study a single painting then that that that's the beginning of knowledge about what painting is really all about at its best yeah yeah, that's a wonderful passage, and you know, I'm going to be talking to my students soon about um, ekphrastic um, mm -hmm. writing, and that is a great ekphrastic passage where he, he yes, really indeed. describes that in such vivid terms. Um, and, to, and you're right, Jim, you know, to be looking at an image of that painting while reading that is really revelatory. Although there was, uh, when the painting was finally brought to the U.S. about 1872, uh, there was a a great, um, a, a great controversy in Boston because people had read had, had read Ruskin and not seen Turner, and they and it was generally felt in Boston in 1872 that Ruskin's passage was much it's better. better. Than <laughs> <Yeah. the painting. laughs> That's true. That's true. Passages that um, that we'll read next week, I think you'll find quite different. Um, you know, we're moving into Modern Painters Five, and so Ruskin is, you know, is he's still writing about art, um, but he's more concerned, as I said before, you know, with also the social and political implications of art. So it'll be really interesting to see, you know, in comparison how people feel about those passages and what they get out of them. Um, and from this one, as I said, I wish that we could spend more time on each volume. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe at some point we'll come back and do more of that uh, because I know it must it might seem kind of strange to skip from volume one to volume five uh, but when Gabriel and I talked about it we thought it might be good to give people a taste of you know kind of you know the first and the last so you get a sense of the the shift in tone and shift in focus as well right the trajectory really. yeah yeah absolutely well the 1850s were it was a time of enormous personal change for Ruskin mm -hmm. 
he you know he was giving up his beginning to give up his art criticism he's he was rejecting his the evangelical training that he had gotten when he was a boy and he was coming around to really looking at his own society as critically as he could and come came out with this incredible little book that we have discussed before in these sessions until this last mm -hmm. in 1860 and modern painters 5 was published in 1860 so it's right right on the pivot of his entire life. He always said that Unto the Last was the most important book that he ever wrote. Mm -hmm. And Modern Painters 5, which is just brilliant and wonderful, um, also came out in the same year. And maybe we can talk about some of those things when we gather next week. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to let people know that, um, obviously you can go to the, the Ruskin at Lancaster to the website and find the Ruskin's complete work. So library edition has been digitized there. So you can find that. Um, but they also have a Modern Painters one is there. You can actually they've digitized that, they scanned it and you can look at um, an edition of that online as well right. at, the, at it, the same site. That's actually also on our website, the Ruskin Art Club website. Okay, I thought that but I wasn't we, sure if there was uh, a- yeah, It's under okay. resources. We have the link okay. there, PDFs of, um, of, uh, of the whole library edition. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarah, maybe uh, some, maybe some recommendations about if people want to read more and and they're not maybe prepared to read all of Mark Painter's one. Um, any any um, suggestions about excerpts or other other collections of Ruskin's works where people can get a sampling? Of them? Um, I think these the passage that you just read from on um, on water, a truth of water, truth of water, and truth of clouds. I would especially recommend reading from Modern mm -hmm. Painters one. Um, it's hard to say which parts I would say read all of it, <laughs> but um, but especially those I think would be good to read. Oh, someone's asking what's the website with his works. Um, it's I don't it's link. I cannot know what it is off the top of my head. Yeah, well, it's it's on the Ruskin Art Club yeah. website. It's www.ruskinartclub.org on the resources page. If you go if you scroll down to the bottom of all the listings on the resources page, there is the Lancaster PDFs of the library edition. So it's all there. Yeah. Um, I always recommend Clive Wilmer's selection from Ruskin. Mm -hmm. it's, it's onto this last and other writings. Now the selection from Modern Painters in here is from Modern Painters 5. Mm. Uh, the two boyhoods from Modern Painters 5, which right. is, right. Uh, I also thought about having us read that, but ultimately decided to do something else. Um, I think a lot of the excerpts from Modern Painters tend to be from later editions, the later volumes. Um, I know in Clive's, Clive's selection, they are. Uh, Rosenberg's The Genius of John Ruskin has a lot from Modern Painters. Mm. One. So okay. it has a lot from Of Truth of Clouds, Of Truth yeah. of Water, and so forth. So you can sample that. Yeah, and Cl Clive's book is available online. Yes. And Rosenberg's is available online. So mm -hmm. anybody who's interested can order them up. Well, actually, I think I'll have to check. I think we have posted um, Rosenberg's book, so you can ch check on the resources page. Oh, you mean like a PDF of it? Yeah, a PDF. Oh, of it. okay, okay. Because we found it online, so very good. Uh, anything else? Any other comments or? Well, I'm I like, wondering. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Like, no, I was just going to say I, really, <laughs> I like this format. I like the give and take. I like the idea that we're throwing around ideas, beginning to get each other to think in new ways about these materials. Good for you. Good, good format. And I'm wondering for people who are coming to Ruskin, maybe not for the first time, maybe to Modern Painters for the first time. I was just kind of wondering what the experience was like. You know how they found um, how they found reading. These selections. Well, I'm a I'm a student of uh, philosophy at the Dominican School up in Northern California, and it's okay. so crazy how Platonic this is. <laughs> just yeah, it was just very it was very fun because we're going over uh, some of the um, material actually yesterday. Mm -hmm. Wow, because I'd never read Modern Painters before. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was very interesting. 
Well, Ruskin read Plato all his life and extensively. Yeah. And you know, he even embarked on his own translation of the laws at one point. Good. No, that's fantastic. Thanks for, so much for doing this. I've been talking to Gabriel about, I, I'd like to uh, kind of get into Ruskin in a group level and this came at the right time. Mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Uh yeah, no, I, I love this idea of, of reading groups too. I, I, I teach, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I lead these seminars for, uh, it's called Portland Literary Arts. It's a local organization. Um, and I've taught on various writers. I just led an eight week seminar on Emily Dickinson, which was fantastic. I loved it. But it's, you know, it's a group like this and, you know, people come together who just want to get much more deeply into a text or an author. Um, and we sit for two hours and we talk about it. And it's a really great way to, to read in community because you know, reading alone is, is great, but sharing ideas and you get insights from other people. And I just think it's a good way um, to approach a text. I'm very glad that we're doing this. Yeah, great. Did anyone have any other questions or, or, or insights or something we didn't touch on that you had hoped we would? I think Gabriel, you said you're you're going to post that article of mine. And I'm not trying to push my own article, but it is about Plato and um, and Ruskin. Yeah, so we'll post yeah. that tonight on the Ruskin Art Club website. Yeah, it'll be what where we'll post it is where we uh, those of you who've gone to the website, I urge you to do so. Look at the calendar listing for this event, and under it, it will have materials, and it will have the PDF of the readings for this session and the PDF is already there for next week's session. And I will post uh, Sarah's essay on Ruskin, Plato, and aesthetics also there. So you'll, you'll know where to look uh, for, the, uh, uh, for this uh, supplementary material. Yeah, I couldn't believe when I looked at the date that that was 2010 that I published that. I'm like, where have the years gone? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think that's someone just signing off. Yes. There, yeah. Well, I know Sarah has to leave right at 6.30, so I'm just gonna kind of uh, wrap it up here briefly. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for getting our feet wet in modern painters and, uh, and for giving us a, a, a being the glue that kept this, uh, this discussion together, wonderful. Uh, we look forward to next week's look at the final volume of Modern Painters, Modern Painters 5. Um, again, if possible, please go over the study materials for next week, do the readings, look at the excerpts. You know, it, it just, um, it, it makes a big difference, I think, to our discussions. Yeah. If people are familiar uh, with the material and you've, you've formulated some questions and some, uh, some things that you want to bring into the discussion. Um, if you have any comments or questions for Sarah or me or suggestions about these and other programs or suggestions about methodology or what you would find helpful, uh, you can email us at info at ruskinartclub.org and we will receive those messages and respond. So I think without, I think we're close here. Yeah. So um, a good week, everyone, and we will see you all next week. Same, same time. Yeah, I look yep, forward to time. it. Same station. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yep.